These slides first start by introducing some basic terminology that describes the overall structure of reefs as well as reef components and then focuses on the functional mor morphology of reef building groups, in particular discussing the features that might make organisms more suited for reef building. You may be familiar with reefs today, these beautiful structures built by corals that you find in tropical environments, but corals have not always been reef builders. In times in the past, different organisms such as sponges were the dominant reef constructors, and there have been other times in Earth history when reefs were much rarer they are today, and in some cases even more common than they are today. A reef in its broadest sense can refer to a variety of, of features, but there are some more specific terms that are used in, by paleontologists or by sedimentologists to describe these, these features. Uh, the first distinction is between something called a bioherm and a biostrome. A bioherm is what you might think of as a reef today. They are uh, features that have, are massive, and this means that they do not have bedding or layering within them. Bioherms also have relief above the seafloor, meaning that they stick up off the seafloor. Because of that, adjacent beds, or the layering beside the reef, will do something called onlapping. The onlapping is most easily seen in the, the top left picture here of this Devonian bioherm from Alberta. If you trace the, the, the beds next to the reef, you'll find that they become thinner and closer together as they drape on, or as they onlap on top of the reef. Just to highlight that with the lines, you can see these beds, if we trace them out, they're further apart when they're off the reef, and then they become closer together as they onlap onto the reef. The reason for this is that the reef itself sticks up above the seafloor, so there's less space for sediment to accumulate, so there are thinner layers of sediment accumulating there. Bioherms, because they have relief above the seafloor, also are often flanked by what are called talus slopes. These big, rubbly areas composed primarily of reef debris, broken up corals, and, and so forth. The other reef type are things called biostromes. And a biostrome is bedded in that it is, is primarily a layer. Biostromes do not have relief above the seafloor, so you don't see onlapping beds. And there are no adjacent talus slopes because they don't stick up above the seafloor. They cannot shed debris down into a deeper basin. This, the lines here highlight the, this biostrome made of stromatoporoid sponges. It's not much to look at here, but the rubbly blobs that you see are the individual sponge features. Reefs can be made by a variety of organisms, and those organisms can be grouped into what are called guilds. A guild is an ecological category that groups organisms that fulfill a certain function within an ecosystem. In this case, these are organisms that, that play a similar role within the reef. They may not be taxonomically related, but they, are, they can be grouped because they have a similar function. So the main reef guild, especially today, are the constructors. Today, those are corals primarily, uh, and these organisms physically make a framework with their skeleton. So a reef today are these large heads of corals. They grow on top of one another, making this rigid structure that sticks up above the seafloor. But reefs also have a couple other types of groups that are very important. The binder guild are ones that help cement the reef together. Um, in modern reefs, these are things like algae and microbes and foraminifera and sometimes sponges, and they are organisms that will grow as almost a coating over the reef surface that helps uh, stick everything together. They will bind the sediment and the other reef components together. There are also bafflers, and these are typically platy organisms or large fan-shaped organisms. Today, a lot of soft corals, some hard corals or sclerotinians, some sponges. Uh, the bafflers because they're these large fan-like structures, they block and they interrupt and slow down the water currents, 
and when the water moves more slowly it is unable to transport as much sediment and so the sediment will will rain out and will uh, accumulate in depressions on the reef that sediment can then be grown over by constructors or binders and this all helps the reef grow upwards So these guilds bring up one other distinction of, of reef types, and that is between a, a true reef and a mound. A true reef is one where there is a framework built by organisms. So constructors with their skeletons are important in making the framework. But there are also structures that are called mounds that may have relief above the seafloor. The, the Carboniferous example from New Mexico is, has been exhumed, and so what you see is what would have more or less been like on the seafloor. But within that, there are almost no skeletons, and these are made with a lot of mud and cement, and especially microbes probably, or b other bafflers and binders. The slab on the right is a Devonian example, and all of the sort of spongy uh, white and brown mottled appearance that you see is microbial textures that you would have seen in, in lab, these like similar to the analysis from the, the Cambrian limestones. A lot of the, the light gray uh, material is cement, which helps attach things together, and there is some sediment and, and in the middle, a brachiopod shell. The brachiopod is an example of a dweller, an organism that lives on the reef but does not significantly contribute to building the reef. The relative importance of these guilds has changed over time. Uh, the, the graph shows from the Cambrian through to today on the, the right hand side, the per percentage uh, in each reef that is composed of the three major guilds uh, grouped into these, these time intervals. And what you see is that the binder guild, I've highlighted in, in red in the Paleozoic, was really dominant. In some cases, 80 or 90 percent of the reefs were, were dominated by binders. Uh, but today, and throughout much of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, the constructor guild, which I've at least partially highlighted in yellow here, um, were, are the dominant reef builders. The constructors have varied over time. The, order, the Silurian and the Devonian um, is a sort of a minor peak in, in reef building of true reefs. And the Carboniferous and then Permian have very few true reefs and many, um, cons many structures with binders or bafflers as the dominant group. So what makes an organism, or what makes an animal, a good reef framework constructor? There are probably a variety of reasons, but one that is likely or thought to be important is modular growth or colonial uh, f growth, and also the integration of the colony. So most reef building organisms are modular or colonial, so sponges and corals in particular, uh, and are often highly integrated. We'll get back to this idea of integration in a second. But colonialism or modularity has a variety of benefits. The organism has a longer lifespan and a larger size. Each individual polyp or member of the colony might die, but the overall colony can essentially live indefinitely. Colonies can also regenerate if part becomes damaged, perhaps because of sediment influx or predation or something. Uh, the other members of the colony can regrow over that damaged area to continue occupying that space. They have what is called indeterminate growth, which means that they do not have a theoretical maximum size that they reach. Most solitary invertebrates, like a snail or, the, or a clam or things like that, their growth will slow down and effectively stop once they reach a certain age because of food or oxygen limitations. But colonial organisms don't have this limit, and so in theory they can grow indefinitely, allowing them to occupy a greater area of substrate. And because they're colonial, they're able to modify the colony shape and form, which gives them flexibility to adapt to different environmental conditions. So this idea of integration is the idea that because of connections between the living individuals, the living individual polyps in a coral, for example, um, they can share soft tissue, they can share their gastrovascular system or their gut, and they can effectively act as one organism, one superorganism. So what evidence do we have for colonial integration in corals? Well, what we want to know is to what extent were the soft tissues connected, but of course these are fossils, so we don't have the soft tissues. All we have is the skeleton. 
But we can look at things like the nature of the walls. Um, if the walls that separate coralites have little holes in them, are perforate, then suggest that there might have been some soft tissue connections between the individual polyps. Uh, an equ equivalent of that in the fasciculate forms would be communicate, where there are small cross branches that connect the, the tubes that may have had soft tissue. Some corals have even reduced or eliminated the walls in altogether, so we can look at the presence or absence of the epitheca, the outer coralite wall. And finally, we can look to see if there is shared skeleton, often called senenchyme, between the coralites. This suggests that the individual coralites were somehow working together to deposit a skeleton that was not necessarily associated with one individual polyp. So there must have been some soft tissue covering it that they were able to, to you know, share uh, nutrients or, or, or otherwise um, share uh, tissues. So low, low integration corals would be ones where the coralites are separated by solid walls. As we see in many serioid corals, the example in the left is a tabulate, but there are also serioid rugos and serioid sclerotinian corals. Or cateniform corals, the, these chain corals in, in the right-hand picture, which are primarily, or is almost only found in tabulates. Some coralites are not even in contact at all, as in the example of the fasciculate or the fasciloid corals, where they're sort of pseudo-solitary. They are living in a colony, but they're in their own individual tubes, not connected or communicating with any of the other corals. In contrast, we can look at high integration levels by noting that the coralite walls might be absent. In the case of the asteroid and the thamnasteroid and the aphroid, they all have some variety of reduced walls, shared septa, indicating that their gastrovascular systems might have been confluent, as it's called, or, or, or joined, uh, or the aphroid, where there are not even any septa at all in these rugose corals, um, or the meandroid, the, the so-called brain corals, where they, the, the polyps are living in this, this, connect, the, this uh, row of connected polyps. Or, as again, we can look at this shared skeleton in the the synosteoid or the synenchymal corals, sclerotinians or, or tabulates, for example. So to summarize, the reef, in a loose sense, can be a bioherm, these unbedded structures with relief above the seafloor, or a biostrome, uh, which are these bedded structures that do not have any relief. Reefs are, are built by constructors or binders and or bafflers, but really it's only the true reefs are the ones with a rigid framework made by a constructor. There are also mounds, which are often considered reefs in a loose sense, but are not strictly reefs given the definition. Nearly all of the Metazoan reef builders, the animal reef builders, are colonial organisms. So it's possible that having highly integrated colonies may be important for framework construction. So the question that we can then address, and this is what we will address in, in class, is the question, is there evidence from the fossil record that highly integrated corals were more likely to participate in reef building, or are intervals with more integrated corals also intervals with greater reef building? So we will use some data to try and address those questions in class.